So yeah, we are gonna talk about protecting trees, um, especially during the time of construction. And I can say that as, uh, as an agent, and maybe I can speak for the other Horde agents that are on here and even some of the, the ag agents that make these types of visits. Uh, we wish people would talk to us before they build a house if their objective is to save even a single tree on their property, but we never get that call. We always get the call um, after, you know, maybe even as, as many as seven years later after they built the house um, that they start to see damage, they start to see decline in, in a particular tree that they just, you know, maybe they picked that particular site because of that one tree and, and now they're losing that tree. And there's so many things that could have been done um, if we just looked at it before the first shovel uh, of dirt was moved on the site. And so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about as we move through this presentation today. Do that, you know, a lot of times people, they get blindsided on, on building a house, uh, all the interior type of work, the type of siding that goes on it, uh, the, the, whether it's brick or whether it's the driveway color, you know, all these different types of things that uh, people want to consider. And those are all important decisions. But a lot of times we, we tend to miss the trees that are on the property. And again, if we're trying to protect those, a little bit of effort has to be put into uh, protecting those trees. And certainly preservation of mature trees is a lot easier than trying to later come back and, and address the problems that they have, or even um, in a worst case, having to take a, take a tree out. That's a pretty expensive process um, compared to just making a few steps up front uh, to preventing that types of problem. Construction damage is probably the most common cause of tree death and decline in urban areas. Um, with tighter lots, with smaller building lots, if there are existing trees there, it doesn't give a lot of flexibility flexibility, a lot of room to move around. And so that's when we tend to see the majority of these types of issues. So here's just a picture, just an example. No doubt that tree was pre-existing uh, before that house was built, but it's the only one that has died. And if you look at its location, uh, that's most likely the, the primary entry point into this, uh, into this nice big house. Uh, a few steps and I mean, it's far enough away from the tree. I mean, the tree's far enough away from the house. A few things could have been uh, put into place to protect that tree and it would still have been alive. Most likely, We're not, we don't know exactly what killed the tree, but just an example of, of many cases, this is what you see after a new construction project. So we're gonna talk in the beginning here, just kind of go through the, the main ways that trees get damaged during construction. And then we're gonna come back and talk about ways to um, reduce those risks and, and, and uh, reduce the type of damage. So these are the, the five uh, main ways that trees get injured during construction. And uh, we'll just kind of take these one, one at a time. So the first one here is physical injury. That's a pretty obvious one. Anytime equipment moves around near trees, there's a chance that they're gonna break branches or tear bark. Some of this is pretty superficial. You know, we may have a broken limb, but you can prune that limb off and the tree would recover and move on. Sometimes it can be damaged to the trunk and that's a little bit more severe. Although a small wound like you see in the picture at the top um, isn't that bad. Sometimes it can be a lot more uh, permanent type damage. And you can see in the tree in the bottom of that picture here, uh, major limbs have been, have been uh, damaged. There's a lot of things going on around the trunk of that tree causing uh, permanent damage to the tree. Uh, and that's gonna be the type of stressors that a tree can probably unlikely recover from. Uh, another one of the, the, the problems that we have during construction is the cutting of roots. And this one's probably the, the number one issue. And it, it comes from the fact that we have to move in utilities we have to uh, add sidewalks and driveways. And one thing that this picture should show you about uh, the tree root system is that maybe you have heard, if you're, on this, if you're on this meeting, you've probably been to some other meetings and I'm sure you're a little bit more um, horticulturally aware that the roots of the tree don't just grow straight down like a carrot, right? Uh, they, they spread out and they spread out not just to what we call the drip line, uh, which is the outer edges of the branches, but sometimes as much as two or three times beyond that drip line. And so when we come in and we, we're trenching and we're putting in driveways, we're gonna be moving and removing um, root system. And that can have a, a major impact on the tree. So here's 
Here's some examples of where trenchers come in, and this is pretty commonplace. You've got to run, uh, you got to run your utilities to the house, and so they come in and they they dig a trench with a backhoe uh, to lay those utilities. <clears throat> May, uh, losing as much as 15 to 25 percent of the root system is a major impact on the tree, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. I think they assume if we're only cutting on one side of the tree that we still got all the remaining roots uh, there. One of the other side effects of that, of course, is if you're removing some of the anchoring roots on one side of the tree, that makes the tree um, even a little bit more prone to fall over. Um, there's no longer a support system there of the root system, and so it could topple over in a windstorm where otherwise it, it may have never had that issue. Okay, a third one is soil compaction. Uh, I know that we've had programs on this uh, Wednesday webinars here about soil, and hopefully you remember that soil um, is made up of 50% of something and 50% of nothing. And that nothing is that pore space. And that's a very important nothing for the roots to develop in. That's where the air, air uh, supply is to the root system. And yes, roots need air. Um, and it's also where the water supply goes. Just one piece of heavy equipment moving over the soil, making three passes can uh, result in the loss of 80% of that pore space. It's difficult for trees to grow in a heavily compacted soil. And you've probably noticed this even in, in the smaller scale, just planting flowers in a really hard compacted soil, they don't do well. They need good airflow uh, in the root system, uh, in the soil. And by running heavy equipment over that, we're, we're removing that airspace, we're removing that pore space, and it's difficult to get it back. We can increase organic matter, we can do other things, but adding pore space back into the, into the soil is a little bit more tricky. Grade changes can occur. If it's not a perfectly level lot, then there's probably gonna be some sort of a grade change. And um, thinking back to that picture of the tree and its root system spreading out, uh, it's also important to remember that the roots are near the surface of the soil. Um, again, it's not a carrot, it's not growing straight down. In the top, uh, I'd say a foot to two foot is where the majority of the root systems are, and certainly the majority of the fine roots that do all of the absorption of water and minerals. So anytime that we add soil uh, to an area, we raise that soil grade, even if it's just a few inches, that has a, a major impact on the plant. Uh, and, and likewise, if we're lowering, if we're removing soil, if we're grading out soil, then in that case, uh, the, the roots are, are no longer there. We're removing the roots and we're removing a large percentage of that root system. And those have some major impacts on the plants as well. So in these pictures, you can see in the top, um, we have what we like to see. And of course that's in a natural setting here, but the trunk comes down and it flares out. This is the root flare. And this is the part of the tree where the trunk becomes the root system. That's what we like to see is the trunk coming down and flaring out. This is not what we see in this picture. And you can see the guys come in and started digging. How much soil do you think has been added to that area? Uh, my guess is it looks, looks close to two foot of a uh, backfill that has been uh, brought in most likely to level the lot. And uh, for us, when we go out to make site visits from uh, trees that look like telephone poles, that's a dead giveaway that something has happened to the site, even if it's a few years later, um, that backfill has occurred, that, uh, that the, the roots are now too deep into the soil. And then the last one, and I think this one gets missed a lot um, as far as what causes problems to plants, to, tree, to trees, is exposure to the elements. So in some situations, we have a, a wooded lot. Uh, and if we're building into a wooded lot, we have a group of trees with uh, trees that kind of rely on each other. In some cases, they may even have root systems that, that feed each other. Uh, that doesn't happen with all types of trees, but with some types of trees it does. Uh, but what we do know about a group of trees is that those on the outer edge are protecting the inner trees from wind and from sunlight. Uh, they also tend to grow higher and the canopy is much higher up. Uh, versus uh, lower limbs that spread out for a tree that's maybe out in an open field type situation. That tree that's out in the open area gets the brunt of the wind on either side, it gets the sunlight, and it develops differently than trees that are growing in a, in a clump or in a group together. And so when you go in and you remove a good portion of those and you only leave a handful of those trees, then you're setting those trees up for failure. Uh, so here's a couple of pictures, and that's, it should be pretty obvious when you look at that, is that there were quite a few other trees on these sites 
uh, before the construction of these two homes, right? Because the, the dead giveaway here is look how there are no side branches coming up. These are huge trees, but no limbs until you get to the very, can the very top of the canopy. So that's an indicator that we had a large group of trees here. So the concern is maybe they did everything else correct and they protected the root system during the construction uh, phase, but now we've got a tree that hasn't been used to this much wind shear, hasn't been used to this much exposure to sunlight. And so we have to be um, aware and just kind of watch in the future to make sure we don't see um, major problems occurring to those trees. So let's talk about avoiding construction damage next. Uh, first, we need to realize, and I know that uh, if you're, again, if you're on these, on these programs, you're probably a gardener, you probably like plants. It's not practical, and in many cases, not even desirable to save every single tree on the lot, right? Because there's a lot of trees that's got problems, and they need to be taken out when the time is right. Um, and sometimes during the construction phase, that's a good time to come in and just kind of clear out a lot of trees that don't need to be, to, need to be left. Um, so we're not trying to save every single tree. We're just looking for the, the best um, structurally sound trees, the healthiest trees. Those are the ones that we're trying to preserve. And keep in mind that it's not always the biggest tree on the property. In fact, you'll probably have better success if it's a younger tree because the root system is a little bit more um, closer to the tree. It's a little bit less to try to protect. And it may be more vigorous so that it can um, work itself out of any stressors that may happen during that construction phase. So these are, uh, what we'll talk about next here is what are some ways that we can put into play uh, to avoid construction uh, damage? And I think this might be a good time to point out um, that this presentation and uh, the information that we're sharing today isn't just something that, that comes from the extension world that we just put these things together. This is all based on uh, a lot of research and let's see if this is showing up. So this is, um, this is a booklet that's put out through the uh, International Society of Arboriculture, and uh, this is called Managing Trees During Construction. And a lot of go to this page, a lot of smart people worked on this book, uh, smarter than I am, and looked at trees in many different situations and worked through the process of what it takes to actually protect that tree and do it in the right way. And uh, this is not something that you would normally just. Uh, you know, you wouldn't pick this up in a bookstore, but if you hire an arborist at the onset, at the beginning of a building project, um, whether it's for your home or maybe you're helping to build a church or something else, they can walk you through those steps and make sure that um, they work with the contractors, they can work with the architect. And if the goal is we're going to protect as many of the, the best looking trees on the property, that's kind of a step that needs to be taken. But for the rest of us, we can narrow this down to just a few things, and these are things that we can do on our own. So let's walk through those next. Um, the most important action you can take is putting up a barrier. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is what you're seeing in this picture right here. Again, think back to that root system. Think back to the things that we've learned so far that the 90% of those feeder roots are in those top few inches of soil right on the surface of the ground, that the roots extend out to the drip line times two times three, depending on how much growth area it is, depending on how vigorous that tree is. Um, this type of situation uh, doesn't help that tree in any, in any shape or form. So we got a few things going on here. I should probably point out, we got some gravel. So they don't typically lay gravel down unless some grading work has been done and some compaction. Is that pretty close to the tree? I'd say that's very close to the tree. We, we are probably impacting easily 25% of the root system uh, in just this grading work. What about other types of compaction? We have no grass here, so something has happened, but in addition to that, we've got uh, heavy uh, dump bins here for waste material uh, setting right underneath the canopy of that tree. It also looks like some sort of wounding has happened here. In fact, a branch had to be recently removed because of that lighter color. Um, so something happened to that, uh, the canopy, maybe from a piece of heavy equipment getting too close, maybe when they unloaded this dumpster, who knows? So these are the types of things that we're trying to avoid. So what does a barrier need to look like? It needs to cover uh, the majority of the root system. So that's a little bit, um, that's difficult to figure out sometimes. But if you just want to do it on the smallest scale, you would erect a barrier, some sort of a fence around the drip line of that tree. That would be in the minimum that you would want to do. Um, another way that you could figure it out is to measure up four and a half feet 
from the from the soil up onto the tree and then measure the the diameter of that tree and for each inch of diameter then go out a foot in all directions around that tree and put your fence and that will give you a little bit bigger area most likely um, if you hire an arborist there's formulas there's guidelines that they use because not every tree grows in a perfect circle right uh, there may be a, an existing driveway or the street and so the, the tree may compensate by sending roots out further just on one side and so that may have to be um, adjusted for but just for you and I, this is probably the easiest approach to take. Putting up a fence needs to be kind of substantial because um, not I'm not saying anything negative about construction workers, but um, if they need to get to an area and you've got a flimsy little plastic fence up, that may not stop anybody from, from moving into that area. There also needs to be some communication uh, about where uh, the construction workers would need to keep materials and that it's important uh, not to put those materials underneath uh, of the tree that you're trying to protect. Otherwise, your barrier is not, not helping. So here's a, here's a couple of examples. You've probably seen these types of fences on, on properties. And I guess my question would be, do you think these are effective? I think if you look at this picture, it's a little bit fuzzy, I'm sorry about that. Um, this looks to be pretty effective. Nothing's happening on, on that side, but we've got a, a barrier fence here to kind of keep people from you know, moving into the root zone underneath this big, uh, kind of looks like an oak tree from here. Is this fence effective? Not likely. We've got people inside of the fence. It's already laid down. Some of it has been removed so that they could run a trench down through. I don't know that that trench is underneath the drip line, but the fact is, is that the fence is not doing its job. Is this fence doing its job? I think that's kind of a joke. Uh, it's not really doing anything at all. In fact, they've just wound it up and piled it over into the corner, uh, and then they've made space to put their pavers in which oddly enough, if you look, are kind of uh, uh, landscape pavers with people's names. I wouldn't be surprised if that's not like something like a botanical garden. All right, so here's really what we're talking about. Chain link fence, signs that state tree preservation area and keep out. Um, the book, the Managing Tree Book from ISA, even recommends if you hire an arborist that you have some sort of litigation in place that if they get into this zone, um, that they will be facing different types of fines. And that sounds pretty extreme, but that's how important it is to keep construction, to keep heavy compaction uh, type things like bricks and, and bins out from underneath of that drip line. That's the number one step you can take to protect the trees, to keep people and items out from that drip line area. And so these, these are some examples here of what people have done that's been a little bit more effective. Okay, the next thing to consider is limiting access. You're the entry routes for equipment, the storage area for construction materials, all of that needs to be um, designated and talked over up front with your, with your contractor. I can tell you that we're, we're looking at tearing off a, I guess you can call it a back porch, uh, an enclosed area off of our house and putting on like a two-story addition on the back of our house. And I've, I've been worried about this because the easiest access point takes them right underneath a huge, I'd say 50, 60 foot uh, tulip poplar tree that you know has roots in all different directions. So I'm going to have to restrict that area by fencing it off and by rerouting them the long way around the house, which might make it more expensive, I don't know yet, just to be able to tear down and to do that rebuilding. There's no trees on the other side, so that makes the most sense but it does make it more difficult to gain access to it. But those are the types of things that have to be, have to be uh, thought through. But it will still be necessary to put some sort of fencing in my situation. Otherwise, if you're gonna stockpile bricks and, and wood and other things, of course, they're gonna put it in the shaded area underneath the tree. So that area needs to be restricted to keep, uh, keep the workers out of it. <clears throat> we also can look at, um, things that just happen on, on uh, construction sites, right? So a lot of times they burn uh, leftover wood materials, some locations. Um, if you're having concrete poured for a driveway or, or for your for a slab, slab uh, construction, they need a place to wash out the, uh, those, the cement trucks. Um, need to try to think about, well, the future driveway is gonna be in this area. So we wanna burn uh, anything uh, that's, that's gonna be left on site. We wanna burn that put it in the area where the concrete's gonna be later, where there's not gonna be anything growing. Even if we're not talking about trees, these things can cause issues later 
um, when you decide to put in something else, maybe a, a vegetable garden or something, and you've got a you've got a concrete pit uh, washout area, and now the pH in that zone is way higher than the existing soil, and you, you're having issues growing blueberries in that zone, just for an example. So just kind of thinking through not just their access points, but where these other types of things need to take place. What if you can't? What if you can't redirect them? They have to go through an area where the trees are, and it is most important that you keep those trees. What else? What other options do you have left at that point? So there are three, and these came straight out of the book, um, three ways that we can still allow access um, and give the most, the next best protection to those trees. The one option is to add a layer of wood chips uh, six to 12 inches deep. So we're talking about a foot of wood chips here, uh, up to 18 inches if it's really heavy equipment uh, around the trees that you're trying to protect. That's successive and it's not meant to be uh, permanent. You can cause a lot of damage by adding 18 inches of wood chips and then leaving them, right? So this is just to disperse the weight as the equipment moves back and forth over that area. You're gonna have to come back out later and remove that when the project gets finished. Um, if you don't want to buy that much wood chips, then another option is to put down a, a smaller layer, of four inches, which could probably be left after that uh, project. And then you buy three quarter inch plywood and lay that on the top of the, the, uh, the mulch layer that you have. And then a third option, and I think these keep getting increasingly more expensive as you look at them, is to take uh, two by four timbers and then you lay them radial to the trunk. Um, and then you lay that three quarter inch plywood on top and kind of make a decking. Uh, basically for uh, for the vehicles, for the people to, to move through. These are the, the ways that will reduce the amount of compaction to the soil so that you don't, um, so that you minimize the amount of, of, of loss to your pore space in the soil. All right, let's switch now to excavation and trenching uh, uh, specifically. So the problem with this is the roots, they get cut. Um, and once they're cut, then they're not able to take up water, mineral elements. Uh, you also, if you cut some of the major um, supporting roots, then we start to lose some stability of the plant. And that happens most often when we're adding sidewalks or we're using buried utilities. Um, we've already mentioned if we can get out beyond that drip line, we're gonna be doing a much better job of protecting our trees. Something like we see here, and this would probably be in a, in a city type of a project, that's too close. We've, we've probably, have, I would say we have killed these trees. This is right within a couple of feet of the trunk of the tree. It would be unlikely that those trees will survive that. Oops. Okay. So the solutions then, again, try to trench outside of the drip line. Um, if there's not space, if that's not possible, then another option is to tunnel under the roots. And I know a few people who have done this, it takes specialized equipment and you're probably not gonna find just a regular contractor that has that, but it can be done. And yes, it's gonna cost more money. Um, again, we're thinking about tree preservation in this, in this presentation. And sometimes that can save us money in the long run um, as far as if, the, if, the, if none of these things are taken, uh, and then these steps are taken and then we are looking at removal of a tree later. Some of these trees, the large trees um, especially, could be as much as $3,000, $5,000 to remove. I think you'll still be under that price point if you take that initiative to tunnel under the roots. Um, and then the third option here, I find these are kind of kind of difficult. I think I know the closest one to us is in Bowling Green that has these air spades. So they're basically a um, a device that blows the soil out away from the tree. It doesn't cut any roots and it allows them to see down underneath the soil because it's removing a trench basically with the use of air. Um, and then you can move your pipes and lines and things underneath that. So that's another option too. But those, those guys are kind of hard to find, the ones with those types of equipment. Here's just a, a slide that's kind of show you how they've done the tunneling here. So in this picture, again, this is what we're talking about. The pipe needed to come right where the tree is. And so they stepped out about a foot, maybe two feet. No, maybe not even that based on this picture from the tree. They're right at the flare. And they just did a trench job and laid their pipe in, right? So that's, that's going to cause the most possible damage to the tree. Probably a little bit more than 25% just looking at this picture here. Whereas if we had gone under the tree, um, 
very little, if any, uh, root damage will have occurred. And you can kind of see the pictures of the, the type of equipment that it takes to do that. And that's why there's some added cost here. It takes specialized equipment to do that. Here's a picture of the air spade, and you can see the workers kind of just removing it, making a trench. And once that's cleared out, and we can see where the roots are, then, um, then the pipe can be, uh, can be laid through that area. And it won't even hurt even the finest uh, uh, absorbing roots of the tree. They, they'll still be intact. And then you can come back in as soon as that pipe is laid, cover the area, irrigate, and it will survive. One of the one of the also um, another advantage of these um, air excavation tools is that it gives us an opportunity to look for roots that are like girdling roots around trees. So it's kind of a little bit off topic, but if you have a tree that has a girdling root or you suspect that, these air spades can be helpful in in, in locating those without damaging the tree. Okay, now I move to excavation. Here we're talking about grade changes. So the problem here is that um, we may have to make a soil cut. And anytime you move soil out, you're going to be removing roots out also um, close to the tree. So uh, the flip side of that is that if we add soil in, then we're going to be smothering roots. And we've already talked about how uh, the pore space is important. And when we fill uh, more soil back over the top, we're going to be reducing that, that pore space. And it's going to make it more difficult for the tree. So leveling a lots is the problem. Some of the solutions, um, one is to work with the architect to, to, to look at how better to orient the house so that we don't have to um, change the grade. And so you can see in this picture, we've got like a, a swell here that where the trees are outside of that area and, and they just built up higher. There's nothing underneath this part of the house. Uh, this is at Burnham Forest. Uh, obviously they're trying to protect trees. Um, and what they've done in this area is they've built a raised walkway, which I think is pretty, pretty neat. And that can be done in any situation. I've, I've seen actually at one of our specialist uh, house, the Horde agents had a meeting there and he had a raised walkway through his uh, wooded area as well. So that's another option. And then you're only putting in posts every so often and you're not doing a huge trench cut through these trees, destroying all those roots and you still have access that that's needed. If the, uh, the problem here is that we need to lower the grade, then there's a few things that can be looked at, something like this tree island or terracing. Um, th these are much more uh, complicated processes. I'm not saying you couldn't do this on your own, but you're probably gonna be hiring uh, someone to come in and, and do this type of work. So um, I don't know if you've seen these. I know that we have one, oh, I'll have that picture in here. Uh, we have one here in Hopkinsville at the community college where, where our parking lot was brought in. But there was a huge, very, very nice looking tree and they just built a tree island. They protected that tree. They went out beyond the drip line. They built a wall around um, that soil as they excavated everything else out. And that tree has been there for years. It's doing great. So those, those, these options, yes, a little bit more on the expensive side, but they do work. And if, if it's important to keep that particular tree, then there are some options. Um, so we're talking here about raising a grade and a tree well is an option where you leave the, uh, the soil underneath the tree in place and then you build the wall up kind of in reverse of what we just saw. Okay, so if you make it through all of those steps and you've done everything great, um, don't forget in the final stages, that's when the, the landscape crew shows up and they hook up all your irrigation system, um, that there can be a lot of damage just from running those irrigation lines um, that, if you've, the contractor's left, the house is built, and now the, the landscaper shows up, and most of the time they're going to know. Uh, they're going to know how to protect those trees and keep that from happening, but sometimes they may not. And so you want to make sure that they're not coming in and, and trenching uh, all that work you've done to, to, to protect before, trenching just to put your drip irrigation system in or your lawn sprinklers, those types of things. And also, even yourself later, it's easy to, to forget hey, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna plant a flower bed right next to this tree and I'm just gonna till up the entire area. Again, for tilling up even six inches of soil, we're causing a lot of damage to the root system. Um, after the construction project, after the landscaping has been put in, then just some things to keep in mind and kind of continue to do is um, just kind of inspect on a regular basis. You're looking now because uh, some of these trees may be a little bit more stressed. Uh, things like uh, flat-headed apple tree borer, uh, which attack more than just apple trees, um, other types of insect pests that are opportunistic, uh, pine sawyer on pine trees, those types of things. They're going to look for these stressed trees 
and you may have more issues um, going forward with those types of pests. Um, you probably are going to be looking at irrigating uh, a couple times a week pretty deeply, trying to get the soil um, saturated down through there, but not oversaturated. Uh, continuing mulching, keeping that area, uh, keeping the compaction off. Uh, fertilization, you can probably delay that um, after the first year, wait till the first year after the project, um, because if the tree is under stress, adding fertilizer at a time that it's under stress is not a great idea. It would be like if you were just recovering from a major surgery and uh, not feeling your best yet and someone's trying to feed you a, a steak and potato dinner. That may not be the best meal right out the gate. Some of the symptoms you'll probably see uh, from construction injury, you may see smaller than normal leaves. They may be chlorotic or turning yellow. Trees may uh, have premature fall color. So they're dropping leaves in, in August and, and uh, they shouldn't be dropping that early. Uh, the worst symptom that I typically see, and at that point, there's not a whole lot that could be done, is when you see water sprouts all along the trunk, what we call epicormic growth. So all these little twigs are growing out of the, the trunk of the tree. They shouldn't be there. Uh, and of course, dead twigs and branches. And this, this picture here shows uh, the canopy is, is much thinner than it should be, but look at the epicormic growth up and down the branches on that tree. That's a tree that's, that's certainly uh, under a lot of stress. It's got a pretty good canopy yet. It might still recover, but it's a good indicator that the probably most likely construction uh, damage here is, has caused some stress to this tree. Other some things that uh, just to consider, um, you know, it's all no matter what you do, there's sometimes little damage things can happen like limb breakage and just making sure that you're removing uh, the limbs in the right way. If limbs get torn, uh, going in and tracing that wound so that it can start to close up. Um, remember, if you have major limbs, that maybe they need to be removed prior to uh, the construction just to give people more access. Uh, to use this ABC uh, cut method where you cut underneath of the branch first and then you remove the heavy weight and then you go back and make your final cut. Uh, that's the best way to prevent damage. Um, if some compaction has occurred, then you can have someone come in and do this vertical mulching or radial trenching. Radial trenching uses that same air spade. Basically, they're, they're making these radial cuts out away from the trunk of the tree, and then they come back in with a loose uh, filler, some sort of a compost, and that'll help to rejuvenate some of the, some of the roof system. Um, or you can do it yourself by using an auger bit and drilling uh, two inch diameter holes kind of in a grid pattern around the tree and then backfilling in with some sort of a of uh, organic matter, uh, and that can also help uh, improve um, root, root, root regrowth. I'm trying to get out, root regrowth. So this is kind of the final slide, and then we can go to questions. And I guess I just want to make sure that we end here. Sometimes, sometimes you hear a presentation like, like this, and you think, gosh, that's an awful lot. Maybe you should just cut the tree down and just start from a, bank, a blank slate and not worry about the trees. Well, you could do that, sure, but there's a lot of advantage to keeping existing trees uh, on a property. It takes a long time to grow a tree, and you know that already, but so if you have some good trees on the property and you can take the steps to protect them, you're going to see that um, your, your property values um, can increase because of, of good-sized trees that are in good shape. Um, it, it provides other things and we don't have to go through all of those, but you know, some other reasons for doing that is sound barriers, for framing your house, for cooling your house during the summer, um, all different types of, of reasons why we um, enjoy having trees on the property and why it's still a good idea to protect those that you do have uh, versus trying to solve a problem after it happens. So that's pretty much it for me. And I hope that uh, that answers if, you, if you're in that mindset of, gosh, I'd like to do something to protect these trees, um, that you have some takeaways here that you can implement before uh, the first shovel uh, hits the soil uh, on your new building site. And for those of you who have a fairly new home and you have just seen trees losing them left and right, um, maybe now this might lend itself to, to an explanation about what's going on on the property. So I'll stop there. If we have any questions, then uh, we can, we can entertain those now.